पॉट ऑफ गोल्ड मॉड्यूल सिक्स प्लॉटर्स पॉट ऑफ गोल्ड एपिसोड टू एनआईओएस सीयू एंड अदर यूनिवर्सिटीज Society in the beginning of comedy in Rome, anti-Roman sentiments may have run rampant to Asculum, a city on the Roman Empire's Adriatic coast, but it was still no laughing matter. Politics in the first century BCE, when Asculum and other Italian tribes rebelled against the empire, in what would come to be known as the Social War, were no joke. But that still didn't stop comedians and actors from injecting politics into their performance, often at their own risk. In a story recounted by a Diodorus Siculus in the Library of History, a performer and poetess, an anti-Roman stance, only to murder, only to be murdered by Roman soldiers for doing so. In the next act, a comedian announced to the crowd. I am not a Roman either. I travel throughout Italy, searching for favors, and by making people laugh and giving pleasure. So spare the swallow, which the gods allow to nest safely if in all your houses. Fortunately, his request was heeded, and he survived the experience. <laughs> Now, going into details, into the matter. We we'll discuss it further about this topic for our own convenience and study, so that it becomes easy for us to understand about this Roman comedy that we are going to study now. Now, but still, didn't stop comedians and actors from injecting politics into their performances, often at their own risk. In a story recounted by Diodorus Siculus, in the Library of History, a performer poses an anti-Roman stance, only to be murdered by Roman soldier for doing so. In the next act, a comedian announced to the crowd, "I'm not a Roman either. I travel throughout." Italy searching for favors and by making people laugh and giving pleasure. So spare the swallows, which the gods allow to nest safely to all our houses. Fortunately, his request was heeded, and he survived the experience. The ancient Romans enjoyed many flavors of theatrical performance from classical theatrical comedies to the more impromptu performances of actors who did short sketches and used physical humor. The earliest known performances came from a town in southern Italy called Itera in the fourth century BC. It wasn't until 346 BC that Roman historian Livy writes of performances in Rome proper as part of a religious festival to request that the gods ward off the plague. But generally speaking, theatre and comedy weren't considered acts of worship. Performances were staged in makeshift theaters, open to the elements, unlike the amphitheaters of Greek performances. And Pompey became the first to erect a permanent theater in Rome in 15, in 55 BC, built of stone and seating thousands of spectators. As theater evolved, comedians began to be staged in public games. Most comedians were poorly paid, but exceptionally popular ones, men like Aesopus and Rosicus, who acted in dramas and comedies, could earn sizable fortunes, including to George Duckworth's *The Nature of Roman Comedy*. There are a few sad caveats when it comes to understand the political comedy of ancient Rome. First, however, much we ought like to interpret Roman emperor. Through the lens of modern taste and culture, a gulf of 2,000 years divides us. Even popular humor from a few decades ago fails to elicit a smirk today, so it is unfair to 
expect comedy from two millennia ago to hold up, as plastics professor Gregory Hayes writes in the New York reviews of books. In studying other cultures, we are trapped as the anthropologist Clifford Geats once put in between the consoling piety that we are like to one another and the worrying suspicion that we are not. Second is the answer is the unanswerable question of which Romans made and consumed comedy. The surviving record unduly privileges men, citizen men, and literate citizens men in Rome, says W. C. W. Marshall, a professor of Greek at the University of British Columbia, that record skews towards a small portion of society. Regardless of the social stature, comedy didn't necessarily mean what we think of as to comedy today. Comedians were often performers who tackled non-tragic work. Comedic poets used puns and wordplay, as did mimes. These weren't silent performances like Marcel Barcio, but rather the equivalent of sketch comedians. But the, and the, their numbers in, even included women. Their performances were largely improvised and used facial expressions and costumes to imitate and mock everyone from pompous politicians to rustic tourists. In the early 200s and late 100s BCE, comic dramatists Plautus and Terence wrote more than 25 plays, combined the earliest complete Latin texts, comedy jokes at us, for wanting to hold on to ourselves, for thinking that our identity is stable, writes the University of Manchester classic professor Alison Sharap in reading Roman comedy, poetics and playfulness in Plautus and Terence. In other words, comedy were funny in part because it upended Roman expectations, whether that meant distinguishing a prostitute as a lady or a seeing a slave outsmart their master. For hundreds of years following the deaths of the two fathers of theatrical comedy, their successes and humor to upend expectations and antagonize, antagonize Roman society engage with the political discourse of the day. Take Seneca the younger, a philosopher and advisor to the Emperor Nero. In 54 CE, Seneca penned a short tract called the Apicolocyntosis, Apicolocyntosis, which mocked the recently murdered Emperor Claudius. In the play, Seneca very skillfully and wickedly mocked Claudius, many physical and mental ailments, including a speech impediment and physical weakness. Writes the classicist H. Mac El Carre. Seneca used Claudius' fondness for dice games. The late emperor wrote a book on the top and even had his carriage and died, uh, outfitted so he could play while on the move as a nasty punishment for the late emperor. A disc cup without a bottom, Seneca could get away with such jabs because his sponsor was the emperor's successor. While Seneca used his pen to elicit laughter and derision, did so with relative impunity, other comedians weren't so lucky. Being a comedic performer instead of a writer came with a major disadvantage. It, instead of a writer, it meant you couldn't be a citizen. Performers were among the infamy, infamy I-N-F-A-M-I-S and couldn't call themselves citizens of Rome or get any of the associated benefits like the limited form of political representation others enjoyed. Now, this means that most comedians who acted were former slaves of people who didn't have any citizenship to lose. For the rare comedians who worked their way out of acting into writing, there was no promise of keeping that either social status in 1946 BCE, Julius Caesar demanded that one of the greatest mind writers of the time, Decius Laberius, perform in a sort of a standoff battle of minds. Laberius would face off 
against a side in ex-slave called Publius. Liberius wasn't overly eager to forfeit his land. But how could he say no to Caesar? So Liberius appeared dressed in the outfit of a side in slave to mock his competitor and said, citizens, we are losing our freedom, as well as he who may fear must fear many. While Laverius lost the competition, he was actually rewarded by Caesar to that he could buy back his citizenship. It is an interesting example of a comedian spontaneously participating in critical political discourse against the most powerful person in the world. Marshall says it may not have happened exactly this way, but the values that the story is exalting are what the Romans thought the purpose of comedy should be, speaking truth to power. Yet laughter wasn't solely a tool of the oppressed. For every laugh in the face of autocracy, there was another laugh by the powerful at the expense of the weak. Writes classical historian Mary Beard in Laughter in Ancient Rome on, on joking, tickling, and cracking up. Romans used jokes and laughter to mock the physically deformed and defeminate, among others. In a number of plays, the reckoning character of the parasitic is given food by a patron simply for laughing at his jokes and sometimes telling them. In modern liberal democracies, comedians are free to express themselves politically. But in ancient Rome, the risk of punching up for comedy six mirror the stories of comedies in today's autocracies. Take Egyptian comedian Basim Yasser, the former surgeon hosted a show that targeted Egyptian president Mohammed Morsi and religious leaders for criticism, citing the president's failure to live up to campaign promises and the Muslim Brotherhood's abuse of power. When the al Sisi government led by the president who came to power through a coup began interrupting or postponing the broadcast of Yusuf's show and then a verdict came through saying he owed millions to his old network, Yusuf fled. Even so, sometimes laughter is better than nothing. When life detail, when life dealt you autocrat, sometimes you have to turn them into a joke. One response by the disinfected violence, the disinfected, disaffected was violence, conspiracy, or rebellion. Beard writes about ancient Rome. Another was the forced to refuse to take it seriously. Now, after this, From Meander to Terence, the traditional Roman comedy, Meander 342 or maybe 41 to C290 BC was a Greek dramatist and best known representative of Athenian new comedy. He wrote 108 comedies and took the prize of the Linania Festival. It is known as Linania Festival. You have to keep it in mind, these types of names. He record, his record at the city, Dionysius is unknown. He was one of the most popular writers in antiquity, and but his work was lost during the Middle Ages and is now known in highly fragmentary form, much of which was discovered in the 20th century. Only one play, Diascolus, has survived almost complete. Life and work. Roman Republican or early imperial. Relief of a seated poet Menander with the masks of new comedy. First century BC, early first century AD. Princeton University Art Museum. Menander was the son of a well-to-do parents. His father, Diopetus, is identified by some with Athenian general and the governor of the Thracian Chirosones, known from the speech of Demosthenes de Perisonesco, 
he permanent he presumably derivated his taste for comic drama from his uncle Alexis. He was the friend, associate, and perhaps pupils of Theophrastus, and was intimate terms with the Athenian dictator Demetrius of Phanera. He also enjoyed the patronage of Ptolemy Soter, the son of Legos, who invited him to his school. But Menander, preferring the independence of his villa in Piraeus and the company of his mistress, Glycera, refused. According to the note of a scholastic on the Ibis of Ovid, he drowned while bathing, and his countrymen honored him with a tomb on the road leading to Athens, where it was seen by Pausanians. Numerous supposed busts of him survive, including a well known statue in the Vatican, formerly thought to represent Gaius Marius. The rival in dramatic art and supposedly in the affections of Glycera was Philomen, who appears to have been popular. Menander, however, believed himself to be a better dramatist. And according to all your jailers, used to ask Philomen, Don't you feel ashamed? Whenever you gain a victory over me, according to Cecilius of Taliset Porphyry in <coughs> Osebius, A U S C B I U S, Preparatio, P R A E P A R A T I O, Evangelica, E V A N G L I C A, Menando was accused plagi of plagiarism. So, this was a sort of accusation that mm -hmm. of course at times could not be tolerated and so naturally it had a lot of controversy mm -hmm. also associated with it now let us not forget all about these differences that did crop up most important thing is that Menander was accused of plagiarism as his superstitious man was taken from the augur of antiphanes. But reworkings and variations on the theme of this sort of this sort were commonplace, and so the charge is complicated one. How long complete copies of his plays survived is unclear, although 23 of them, with commentary by Michael Pesselus, were said to still have been available in Constantinople in the 11th century. He is praised by Plutarch, comparison of Menander and Aristophanes, Quintilian institution or orator, who accepted the tradition that was out of the speeches published under the name of the Attic Order, Carius, Carisius. So keeping this in mind, this name in mind, is very important because later we will come to know why it is so very important to keep such a name in mind. An admirer and imitator of Euripides, Menander resembles him in his keen observation and practical life. His analysis of the emotions has been fondness for moral maxims, many of which become proverbial. The property of friends is common, whom the gods love die young. Evil communications corrupt good manners from Thais, quoted in Corinthians 15 is to 33. These maxims, chiefly monastic, were afterwards collected and with additions from other sources were edited in Menander's one verse maxims, a kind of moral textbook for the use of schools. The single surviving speech from his early play drunkenness is an attack on the politicians Kali made on in the manner of Aristophanes, whose body style was adopted in many of his plays. Menander found many Roman imitators, Lynch, Andrea, Houghton, Timoro, Minos, and Adelphi of Terence, called by Caesar, Demetrius Meander, were awardly taken from Meander, but some of them appeared to be adaptations and combinations of more than one play. Thus, in the Andrea, were combined Menander, the woman from Androids, and the woman from Perintos, in the eunuch, the eunuch and the flatterer, while the Delphi was compiled partly 
from the Milans and partly from Jeffelius. The original terrains, Heclea, H E C Y R A, as of the former, is generally supposed to be not by Menander but Apollodorus of Christus. The backeaters and stitches of plotters were probably based upon Menander's. The double <coughs> deceiver and the brotherly loving men, but the Poenulus does not seem to be from the Carthaginian, not the Mostelaria from the apparitions, in spite of the similarity of titles. Cassius, Celius, Statius, Lucius, Lanivinus, Tarpelius, and Atelius, all imitated Meander. He was further credited with the authorship of some epigrams of doubtful authenticity. The letters addressed to Ptolemy Sauter and the discourses in course in various subjects mentioned by the Suda are probably spurious. Loss of his work. Most of the Neander's work did not survive the middle pages, except the short fragments. Federico da Montefeltro's library at Aribunos reputedly had cute Li opera, a complete work, but its existence has been questioned and there are no traces of the Caesar Borgia's capture of the city and the transfer of the library to the Vatican. Until the end of the 19th century, all that was known of Meander was for were fragments quoted by other authors and collected by Augustus Menica and the Theodor Knock, Comicoran, Atticoran, Fragmenta, C O M I C O R U M, A T T I C O R U M, F R A G M E N T A. 1888. These consist of one sum, 1650 verses or parts of verses, in addition to a considerable number of words quoted from Menander by ancient lexicographers. Terence, Latin for full public, Terentius, Affer, Tacne AFER, born C 195 BC, Carthage, North Africa, now in Tunisia, died 159. Some ages to be included BC in Greece or at sea. After Plotus, the greatest Roman comic dramatist, the author of six verse comedies that were long regarded as models of pure Latin, Terence plays, plays for the basis of the modern comedy of manners. Terence was taken to Rome as a slave by Terentius Lucanus an otherwise unknown Roman senator who was inspired by his ability and gave him a liberal education and subsequently his freedom. So Latin literature comedy became common at that time. Reliable information about the life and dramatic career of Terence is defective. There are four sources of biological information on him. A short gossipy life by the Roman biographer Suetonius, written nearly three centuries later, a garbled version of the commentary on the plays of the 14th century grammarian Aeneas Donatus. Production notices prefixes to the play, text according details of first and occasionally also of later performances and Terence's own prologues to the plays, which despite polemic and distortion, reveal something of his literary career. Most of the available information about Terence relates to his career as a dramatist. During his short life, he produced six plays, to which the production notices assigned the following dates. Andrea, the Andrian girl, 166 BC. Hekira, the mother-in-law, 165 BC. Houghton Timoro, Timoro Menos, the self-tormentor, 163 BC. Eunuch, the eunuch. 161, B. Formo, 161 BC, Adelphia, Adelpho, the brothers, 160 BC, Hekira, second production, 160 BC, Hekira, third production, 160 BC. These dates, however, pose several problems. The unique, for example, 
was so successful that it achieved a repeat performance and record earnings for Terence. But the prologue that Terence wrote, presumably a year later, for the Hikila third production, gives the impression that he had not yet achieved any major success. Yet alternative date schemes are even less satisfactory. From the beginning of his career, Terence was so lucky so to have the services of his Lucius Ambius Tarpio, a leading actor who had promoted the career of Sassilius, the major comic playwright of the preceding generation. Now in old days, the actor did the same for Terence. Yet not all of Terence's production in Judge success. The Hakira failed twice. Its first production broke up in an uproar when rumors were circulated among the audience of alternative entertainment by tight rope walker and some boxers, and the audience deserted to second production for a gladiatorial performance nearby. Terence faced the hostility of jealous rivals, particularly one older playwright, Lassius Lanu Venus, who launched a series of accusations against the newcomer. The main source of contention was Terence's dramatic art method. It was a custom for these Roman dramatists to draw the material from earlier Greek comedies about rich young men and the difficulties that attended their armors. The adaptations varied greatly in fidelity, ranging from the creative freedom of plotters to the literal rendering of Lucius. Lucius. Although Terence was apparently fairly faithful to his Greek model, Lucius alleged that Terence was guilty of contamination, that is, that he had incorporated materials from secondary Greek sources into his blocks to their detriment. Terence sometimes did extraneous material. In the Andrea, which, like the Eunuch, Teuton, Timorosus, Timoros, Nos, and Adelphi was adopted from a Greek play of the same title by Menander. He added material from another Menandrian play, the Perintia, the Perintia girl. In the unit, he added to Menander's Unu cost two characters, a soldier and his parasite, a hanger on his flattery of and services his patron, were rewarded at free dinners, both of them from another play by Melander, the Colax, the Parasite. In Adelphi, he added an exciting scene from a play by Defilius, a contemporary of Menander. Such conservative writers as Lucius objected to the freedom with which Terence used his models. A further allegation was that Terence's praise was not on his own, but were composed with the help of unnamed nobles. This malicious and implausible charge is left unanswered, unanswered by Terence. Romans of a later period assumed Terence must have collaborated with the Scioponic Circle, a coterie of admirers of Greek literature, named after its guiding spirit, the military commander and politician Scipio Africanus, the younger. Terence died young when he was 35. He visited Greece and never returned. From the journey. He died either in Greece from illness or at sea by shipwreck on the return voyage. On his, of his family life, nothing is known except that he left a daughter in a small but valuable estate just outside Rome on the Appian Way. So modern scholars have been preoccupied with the question of the extent to which Terence was a knowledgeable writer as opposed to a more mere translator of his Greek models. Positions on both sides have been rigorously maintained, but recent critical opinion seems to accept that in the main, Terence was faithful to the plot, ethos, and characterization of its Greek originals. Thus, his humanity's individualized character and his sensitive approach to relationship and personal problems all may be traced to Menander and his obsessive attention to detail in the plots of Hikaira and Polonia, derives from the Greek models of those plays by Apollodorus of Charistus of the 3rd century BC. 
Nevertheless, in some important particulars, he first reveals himself as something more than a translator. First, he shows both originality and skill in the incorporation of materials from secondary models, but as well as, as occasionally, perhaps, in materials of his own invention, he seals his materials in, with unobtrusive scenes. Second, this Greek model is probably had expository prologues informing the audiences of vital facts, but Terence cut them off, leaving his audience in the same ignorance as his characters. This omission increases the element of suspense, though the plot may become too difficult for an audience to follow, as in the Hikaira. Striving for a refined but conventional realism, Terence eliminated or reduced such unrealistic devices as the actors direct and just to the audience. He preserved the mastery of his model with a nice appreciation of how much Greek weakness would be tolerated in Rome. His language is a purer version of the contemporary colloquial Latin because they are more realistic. So we see that Individual scenes retain their power today, especially those presenting brilliant narratives. For example, Carrier's report of his rape of the girl in the Unicus, civilized emotion. For example, Mistress forgiveness of Achenus in the Adelphi, Patches's renunciation of Pamphilus in Hikaira, or clever theatrical strokes. Example, the double disclosure of his crime, crimes by Gemi in the Formio. The influence on Terence on Roman education and on later European theatre was very great. His language is accepted as a form of pure Latin, and his work was studied and discussed throughout the antiquity.